You know, and these are not, you know, nobody contests any anything I just said. I mean, these are, these are, um, you know, non-contested by economists on the right or the left, but they're just, it's just simply not talked about, right? It just simply, you know, look at this shiny thing over here. Let's not talk about the fact that the economy hasn't been working for the bottom 80% of the population for 50 years, right? Appreciate y'all being here for the North Alabama School for Organizing, organizers, I should say. And uh, and we're so glad to be in collaboration with the University of the Poor. And uh, the North Alabama School for Organizers was created to educate to organize, to, to do cross uh, inter intersectional, intersectional um, uh, training and uh, classes. And uh, what we would hope to do is, is to train organizers and to uh, train the community and give them as much, you know, uh, information as we can to make their job a little easier. And so uh, we, we realized that a lot of organizations kind of fell apart after a while and organizers fall apart after a while and they need to go back to their, you know, their values. And so we try to do that uh, through a number of different ways. One of them is classes that we have, like this one. Uh, the other one is we do uh, fireside chats and we would bring in uh, activists and we uh, interview them and we post it on our, you know, on our uh, uh, website. And we also uh, put it on YouTube that people can use later. And so we're moving into a, a completely, a little different area and getting more involved in the community now, supporting the community. We just uh, talked about having a, 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 like a film festival this, this fall, bringing in more people. So uh, that's basically what we do is educate to organize. Uh, we got really good contacts with the University of Alabama Huntsville here and Tennessee Tech and, you know, community organizations and, you know, and you folks and we're just, we're just pleased to have you here and that's basically it in a nutshell. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I am Colleen Wessel McCoy and I want to introduce the other co hosts of tonight's educational, um, the University of the Poor and the University of the Poor his mission is to unite and develop leaders committed to the unity of the poor and dispossessed across color lines and other lines of division. So as to build a broad based and powerful movement to end poverty. Uh, within this activity, the University of the Poor strives to lay the basic foundation for a network of revolutionaries. And we have a website that you can visit um, with a, um, you can sign up for our journal and there's resources and, um, learn more about the University of the Poor, it's universityofthepoor.org. So I hope you will join us there. Uh, and then I'm really excited to introduce our educator tonight, Chris Caruso. Chris Caruso is a popular educator, community organizer, and educational technologist. He's been active in the movement to end poverty led by the poor for 30 years. Brought into social consciousness by homeless families taking over abandoned homes, he first got involved with the National Union of the Homeless in 1989. Chris has led popular education workshops for social movement organizations on five continents. He's been recognized as a pioneer in the grassroots use of the internet and has trained dozens of grassroots organizations across the globe in the strategic use of new media. 
Chris was mentored in popular education by alum, alumni of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, the Union of the Homeless, and the Welfare Rights Organization. He received his PhD under Professor David Harvey at the CUNY Graduate Center. A first-generation college student, Chris received his BA from the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm really excited that Chris is here to teach tonight. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, well, it, thanks so much for the generous introduction, Colleen, and thank you for inviting me. Hi, it's really uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, so I've been asked to do a little presentation around why are we poor, and I'm gonna share some slides. And um, obviously we're a, a small group, and so please feel free to stop me and ask questions or raise a point or clarify at any time um, as we go through this. And um, just as a way of preface, we're gonna be talking a little bit about economics. And I know that sometimes when we talk about economics, uh, you know, our eyes glaze over and it's like, oh. Uh, but I, um, I wanna say that I think that it's a very important to have um, some grasp of the kind of at least big picture, broad strokes of what's been happening in our economy and our country over the past period of time, partially because in our culture, we live in such a hyper individualistic culture that um, so many of us who are struggling financially carry around an enormous amount of shame and self-blame. Um, and it's, you know, our society uh, blames the victims, you know, that's the default position for our, our culture, right? We blame the victims. And um, I think one of the reasons why it's valuable to kind of every once in a while take a step back and look at kind of this big picture view is to realize we're dealing with, you know, large term, long term, large scale structural causes um, that are causing our impoverishment. And it's going to, because the, you know, if we, as Martin Luther King says, you know, if we don't have an accurate um, diagnosis of the problem, like we're not going to be able to come up with an accurate prescription of the solution, right? And so, um, it's to that end that we're trying to, you know, look at some of these questions of, you know, why are, literally, why are we poor? Um, and I'm going to try to share some slides. Um, all right. And people can see the UPOR logo, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so, um, so first, Min, little mini section, I want to talk about um, the the recovery, the economic recovery, so as far as it goes from the uh, the COVID crisis, from our, our current um, recession here. And what this first slide shows is initial claims for unemployment. Um, and this is uh, by week. And as you could see, things you know, seemed normal at the beginning of 2020. And then, you know, March is where uh, COVID really begins to hit the United States. And by April, we have these two weeks of more than 6 million people filing for unemployment, um, which has never happened before in our country's history. It's um, actually much worse than the, um, the Great Depression in terms of the um, the rapidity uh, and the depth of the jobs lo jobs lost, right? This happens, you know, virtually overnight uh, in a way that the Great Depression dragged on for many years. And what we could see here is that, um, you know, there's been, obviously we see a downward trend in initial claims for unemployment, but they remain stubbornly high, right? You could see what's quote unquote normal in January, February, March, how short those lines are to see that the week ending on May 1st, we had 498,000 people applying um, for unemployment still. Um, so this has been, um, you know, quite extreme in terms of its impact on jobs uh, and employment. Another way of looking at the similar uh, data is these monthly reports of monthly job growth. And um, you can see that in April 20, you know, we lost uh, 20 million jobs in a single month. 
the worst ever. And that there was some job growth after that. And then it uh, petered off again. And then you could see the past few months uh, in the new year, uh, things had been growing. But then April's uh, last month's job report was a big disappointment. Uh, the economy did add 266,000 new jobs. But the consensus of economists and the Dow Jones estimate was that we were going to see 1 million new jobs in April. And we fell, obviously, very far short of that. We should say, too, that um, you know, just to keep even because of population growth, we need to add somewhere between 150,000 and, and 200,000 new jobs um, every month just to keep up with the growth in the US population. So like the baseline isn't zero, the baseline is about 150 or 200,000 new jobs created. And so April, um, you know, we did not see the economy taking off uh, in April in a way that uh, many economists and politicians uh, were hoping. This chart, compares our 2020 recession, this is the red line, to every other recession since World War II. Most importantly, the blue line is the Great Recession, the 2007, 2008, 2009 recession. And so when you go from, from top to bottom, that's the percent of job losses relative to peak. So the amount of jobs that are lost is how deep it goes down. And then the right and left scale is time. Um, so the number of months it took to get back all the jobs that were lost. Now you could see the 2007, the, the Great Recession, um, we did lose a, a lot of jobs, but the red line obviously is over twice uh, as deep in terms of the job loss compared to the Great Recession. But note that the Great Recession, one of its distinguishing features was that it really dragged on for so long. Uh, taking about six years to get back the jobs that were lost in the 2007 uh, recession. We know too that the jobs that came back um, paid less uh, than the jobs that were lost, but it did take a very long time um, for those jobs to come back. You can see um, there was initially uh, a, a sharp recovery of jobs and um, then some, some leveling off and backsliding and um, but we have a, a very long way to go to um, just replace the jobs that have been lost uh, during the COVID uh, recession or depression. Um, so this just gives us a little bit of a sense of kind of historically where we are. We're still in a very deep hole in terms of job loss. Um, and there has to be, uh, you know, a lot more work to be done just to get back the jobs that were lost. Now, recent recoveries, economic recoveries in US history um, have not been kind to working people and poor people. That um, if we look at the, the three last ones on here, the Clinton boom, 45%. Um, so the top 1%, the top richest 1% of people in the country um, claimed 45% of all the new income in the recovery uh, dubbed the Clinton boom. After the, um, the 2001 recession, the Bush recovery, the top 1% claimed 65% of all new income in that so-called recovery. And even worse, uh, after the 2007, 2008 Great Recession, the so-called Obama recovery, the, one, the richest 1% captured 95% of all of the income growth in that recovery. And so we have recoveries where jobs come back, you know, eventually, but at a much at paying less, uh, you know, stock market booms back, but inequality uh, gets worse, uh, right? And so we uh, are very much in danger of having a, a, a quote unquote recovery that's similar to the Obama recovery where the top 1% captured 95% of all new income gains. Now, this is just talking about, you know, what's been going on uh, recently with our COVID recession. And a number 
of folks are very optimistic and think that, you know, once we get the economy vaccinated, once we get the population vaccinated, once we reach, if we ever reach herd immunity, the economy is just going to take off like a rocket. So far, we haven't seen that. And what I want to do is kind of pull back the frame a little bit wider and talk about, you know, what happened generally to jobs and income in the 20th century in the United States. And you can see this line, um, this dotted line in the middle of this chart is 1973. And before 1973, you see these two lines, the dark blue line is productivity. The amount of uh, you know, goods and services that could be produced in a given amount of time with a given amount of labor. And over time, you know, we figure out ways to do things that are more efficient. We apply more you know, technology to, the, to production and productivity rises. And for a very long time, um, other economists have traced this relationship all the way back to the 19th century. As productivity rose, hourly compensation rose. And so what this compensation number is, is for um, the bottom 80% of wage earners in the United States, so-called non-supervisory workers. And between, in the kind of post-World War II period from 48 to 73, you see productivity rise and wages rise along with it. From 73 on, you see productivity continuing to rise, but hourly compensation going flat. And in fact, for the bottom 80% of, of workers in the United States, our compensation, when you adjust it for inflation, has been flat or falling since 1973, right? That's almost 50 years. That's two generations that has not seen anything like the rising standard of living that happened uh, in the previous period. And this is a long-term structural crisis of capitalism, the economic system we live under, that's getting more and more and more productive, but with wages basically stuck, um, not moving. Another way, another set of data that shows us this, this same phenomenon is that um, if you uh, adjust for inflation and you compare not just the dollar amount of what we get in wages, but what we could buy with it, right? The amount of goods and services we could buy with our paycheck, uh, the purchasing power of the US working class peaked in 1973 um, and has been flat or falling ever since, right? And this, um, this is a big problem. <laughs> this is a big problem, not just for the growth of poverty and inequality, um, but our, we live in an economy that depends on consumer spending um, to, to function, right? Over three quarters of all economic activity in the United States is driven by consumer spending. And consumers, the bottom 80% of us, haven't gotten a raise uh, in almost 50 years. And this creates real problems for how, uh, how our economy can, uh, can function. It also creates social control problems uh, for those that are in charge. Um, because if they can't bribe people by the anticipation of a rising standard of living, or even the idea that you know, our children uh, have a shot at doing better than, than our parents, um, there's a real social control problem. And so if you map this same period against uh, the state and federal prison population, this goes from 1925 to 2014. But if you look again at that year, 1973, and how steep the um, mass incarceration becomes in this very same period, um, such that the United States now is the largest incarcerator on earth, the largest incarcerator in human history, both in terms of the, the number of people that are in our criminal justice system, as well as the percentage of our population that are in the criminal justice system. Uh, the US holds the record on this. And this is one way to manage uh, a population whose labor is less important uh, to the profit-making of capitalism, right? It's to warehouse people in prisons 
which is what this country has done. So um, in the next section, we're gonna talk about uh, why and, and what began to happen in the 70s um, that triggered such a dramatic uh, change. But let's um, pause here for questions or thoughts or observations before we move to the, to the next section, if that's okay. I'm gonna stop share for a second just so I can see people. Okay, it seems like uh, seems like a lot of this started with Ronald with uh, Richard Nixon mm -hmm. uh, when he was in, and they just just continued into Ronald Reagan. You know that when they started busting unions and uh, you know uh, cutting a lot of the federal programs and all you know a lot of the other. Uh, necessary social programs, I think, too. Uh, you know, because I remember in 73, going through a lot of that, uh, I'm losing a job actually in 73 because of, you know, because of Richard Nixon and then later on Ronald Reagan. You know, I think before that they had the war on poverty, which helped out people, but but then uh, these these guys came along and you know, I really didn't give a shit about anybody except for the the top percent, you know, and so they were, you know, you know the whole thing about trickle down economics was just, you know, one of the worst things they could have done, you know, but uh, yeah, I remember those days and it just doesn't seem to have stopped. It just seemed to be carrying on through even the, the democratic, you know, administrations, the but it's capitalism, you know, because they're going to suck the blood out of any poor person that they can they can do it, and uh, and it's um, I don't I don't know what you know uh, our current president's going to do about it, but we'll see, you know. But uh, yeah, do you, think, do you think that's a good assessment, or I absolutely are we missing? Think. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little a whole other bit about what's what's changed in terms of industrial production, but yeah, in terms of on the political front, which is hugely important, that's absolutely right, right? We have the rise of what we call now neoliberalism, uh, which is this idea that free markets are gonna do deliver the best results for everybody eventually, right? This trickle down theory, which is a bipartisan consensus, right? Which, uh, um, you know. Even before Reagan, Jimmy Carter's appointment of Paul Volcker as uh, his head of the Federal Reserve marked uh, the, this kind of turn towards neoliberalism, towards austerity, this idea that we have to cut uh, you know, wages, we have to cut social programs and unleash the animal spirits of the market. Right? And that, that's, what's gonna, that's what's gonna be best for everybody. So yeah, that, this is a big piece of it. Um, yeah, I just, I'm, Hi and I are more or less in the same age bracket, and I wanted to share my memory of that time, too. As I look back on it, 1972, in my mind, was a major watershed in my life. That was the year that Richard Nixon got reelected in the midst of a legal brouhaha that threw him out of office within less than a year after he got elected, I think, uh, certainly less than two years. And he won 49 states. And at the time, I was in Massachusetts at a, a fancy new college called Hampshire College, some of y'all might have heard of working as a janitor in the library as my work study program. And I remember, you know, coming in the library area after that was over, everybody had been sitting around watching it. And it was like the, you know, the, it was like the, the, a terribly destructive battlefield scene at that point, everybody was totally demoralized shocked, disappointed. And I knew at that point that there was something terribly wrong with my country, but I didn't know what it was. And I'm still not sure what happened. But that year, 72, 73, I had no idea that we had the statistics you just showed us to back up what a critical time point that was. But apparently, 
I mean, I, I've sort of grown above party politics, but clearly the Republicans took over and they have not let go of their stranglehold ever since. It's terrible what happened at that time. Yeah, it's really striking that you both had these, you know, serious, like profound experiences right at the same time as these, you know, these major economic changes were going into swing. I think that's really telling. Um, you know, and these are not, you know, nobody contests any anything I just said. I mean, these are these are, um, you know, non contested by economists on the right or the left, but they're just it's just simply not talked about. Right. It just simply, you know, look at this shiny thing over here. Let's not talk about the fact that the economy hasn't been working for the bottom 80 percent of the population for 50 years. Right. Um, all right. So I want to is OK if I move on. All right, I'm going to I'm going to move on to the next section. Um, where'd it go? Hmm. Maybe this. Uh, all right, can you see that? See my slide? Yes. OK, um, so I want to talk about um, you know, economists and historians talk about this idea that we're now living through uh, the fourth industrial revolution. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the previous three, as well as the one we're, uh, we're living through now. And I want to share a little uh, video clip as well, and then have a little discussion about that. Um, but of course, we all know that the um, first industrial revolution uh, you know, this is what, uh, you know, kicks off the transition from largely agricultural societies to urbanization, to people leaving the farm and the development of the factory. Um, this is a image of Watts uh, double acting steam engine, which was a hugely important signal technology, um, which allowed uh, there to be a a motive power, right? A force that could actually help with production that wasn't tied to, you know, a water wheel or a windmill, um, which were other technologies that existed at the time, right? You could use your windmill to attach uh, and be able to grind grains, but, you know, it only worked when the wind was blowing. Uh, the double acting steam engine, uh, originally powered by wood and then by coal, allows them to to take uh, this motive power, this source to, you know, move things in a factory uh, and place it anywhere, uh, you know, they wanted to, to produce. So the first industrial revolution, 1760 to 1840, um, you know, world changing event. Um, second industrial revolution, 1870 to 1914, this is where we see um, oil and, and gasoline come forward as important parts of, of motive power. And, uh, you know, the um, invention of the um, assembly line by Henry Ford, uh, which, you know, greatly, greatly increased uh, productivity. Um, and, you know, this is really this, uh, this time uh, of, you know, very strong uh, union movements uh, throughout the industrialized world and, um, you know, rapidly growing heavy industry. Next time we get a major change uh, is the so-called third industrial revolution, which starts in the 1960s, where we have the beginnings of the integrated circuit, um, the beginnings of the digital economy beginning to be applied into the production uh, process. There's also a new motive power in the form of nuclear energy um, that begins to come online uh, as well in this time. But now that brings us up to the present where we talk about um, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which was what we're living through today. And it has these characteristics. The, the most um, important one is probably artificial intelligence, um, but also um, big data, the collection of enormous, enormous data sets and the application of machine learning or artificial intelligence to them to solve problems. 
the internet of things, right? All these devices that are all communicating with the internet with one another, 3D printing, uh, as well as advanced manufacturing and smart factories, right? That what we've, uh, that unlike the period, the previous periods uh, of the previous industrial revolutions that required large amounts of labor, um, large amounts of, you know, skilled or semi-skilled labor in order to uh, realize a profit at that given level of, of production. Um, we have what's happening now in this fourth industrial revolution, a different relationship um, to labor uh, because of how powerful and how productive these new uh, ways of manufacturing, of creating the things that we need to live uh, has, has created. And so I'm gonna see if I could share this um, video. Um, and uh, you're gonna have to tell me if it comes through okay. Um, all right, so this is about um, 10 minutes and this is, you know, current actual in, you know, in the shop floor, like real life production that's happening today. This is not science fiction or, or future. This is, this is actually what exists right now. Our first product is a robot called Baxter. And Baxter is uh, about human size, two arms, and is able to do simple cases of simple tasks that otherwise would be boring, repetitive tasks. Putting things uh, on the conveyor belt or getting things off a conveyor belt, putting them in boxes, taking them out of boxes. The robot is safe to be close to, unlike current industrial robots. So a factory worker can go up to the robot grab its arm and show it some task to do and the robot can just do it. That's in contrast with current industrial robots where you have to have an engineering team structure the environment for the robot, you have to have safety cages around it because the robots aren't safe to be close to and you have to really know how to do programming to get the robot to do the simplest sort of thing. The interface of the robot is through what looks like its face in its face position. It's a, it's a LCD screen and when it's working or operating normally it actually has eyes on there. Um, why, why, why do I have a robot with eyes? Well, the, the eyes give cues to someone about what the robot's about to do. When it's about to reach over to the right, its eyes look there first and then it reaches. So as you come up to the robot, you can tell what it's going to do next. Every joint in the robot is able to feel force. So instead of being position controlled, we're a force controlled robot. And when it puts something down on a table, um, it's feeling the force as it puts it down. And then, oh, it's down. I'll let go. So if you actually put your hand underneath as it's coming down, it says, well, oh, okay, it's on something, I'll let go of it. Industrial robots have been around since 1961. In the last 10 years, we've seen a tremendous flowering of, of uh, robot applications, not in industrial robots, but in other things. Our robot Baxter is the first of these robots that is collaborative, safe to interact with, easy to, for, for an ordinary factory worker to use. I don't know exactly where it's going to go. I know it's going to be a revolution in, in manufacturing. I, I, I sort of liken it to when the tractor came into farming, completely changed how farming was done. No one wants to go back to hand hoeing. Uh, tractors uh, made farming a much better business to be in. And I think we're going to see that change in manufacturing. The modernist uh, process stage is, it all starts with raw material. We have coils of aluminum, different gauges, different types of aluminum, maybe 50, 60 coils. We start the process by uncoiling the coils in a special machine we call blanking machine that allows to flatten the metal first and then cut it into flat pieces. We call them blanks. In addition to traditional blanking tools, we're using laser. And then with these pieces, we feed them to the press lines, these gigantic dies. And the press lines essentially form the panels, you know, boom. The role of the body center is to take all the stamping panels that we make and we bring all that together in one central location. And that's where we actually put the Model S together. 
We'll start and we do an underbody, which is the main floor system of the car. And then from there, we'll move to body sides. That's the internal reinforcement as well as the outer skin. And inside the framing area, we take the body sides, the underbody, and, and the front end of the car, and we actually marriage it all together. We have a gigantic robot that takes the body and put it into a conveyor. It is conveyed to the paint shop. You have multiple pretreatment, primer, base coat, clear coat. All of this is supplied with robots that have a special ability to paint in a very clean environment. You get a beautiful painted body that's coming to General Assembly where we have these super elegant robots we call smart cart where every car is essentially moving through the factory by itself. It follows a magnetic strip, and essentially, the car is being assembled from inside out. We're utilizing automation to the fullest. We have a variety of robots, from the, the teeny little ones to huge ones that are able to move the entire body itself. One of the robots that I, I, I'm always very impressed to look at is the one that puts the seats inside the Model S. And the same robot is able to change tools, go from a seat handling device to putting the windshield, actually grab the windshield, put some glue around it, and then put the windshield onto the car, as well as do the rear glass of the vehicle. So talk about versatility here. The age of robots has been anticipated since the beginning of the last century. Fritz Lang fantasized about it in his 1927 film Metropolis. In the 1940s and 50s, robots were often portrayed as household help. May I take your hat and coat? And by the time the Star Wars trilogy arrived, robots with their computerized brains and nerve systems had been fully integrated into our imagination. Now they're finally here. But instead of serving us, we find them competing for our jobs. And according to MIT professors Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, one of the reasons for the jobless recovery. Our economy is bigger than it was before the start of the Great Recession. Corporate profits are back. Uh, business investment in hardware and software is back higher than it's ever been. What's not back is the jobs. And you think technology and increased automation is a factor in that? Absolutely. Economic evolution has been going on for centuries, and society has always successfully adapted to technological change, creating more jobs in the process. But Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee of MIT think this time may be different. Technology is always creating jobs. It's always destroying jobs. But right now, the pace is accelerating. It's faster, we think, than ever before in history. So. As a consequence, we are not creating jobs at the same pace that we need to. And we ain't seen nothing yet. The changes are coming so quickly, it's been difficult for workers to retrain themselves and for entrepreneurs to figure out where the next opportunities may be. The catalyst is something called computer learning, or artificial intelligence. The ability to feed massive amounts of data into supercomputers and program them to teach themselves and improve their performance. We absolutely are creating new jobs, new companies, and entirely new industries these days. When, when Eric and I go out to Silicon Valley and look around, the, the scale and the pace of creation is astonishing. What these companies are not doing, though, is hiring a ton of people to help them with their work. Because they don't have them? Because they can't find them? Because, because they, they, they don't can't, need They them. can't find everyone they need, but they don't need that many people to work in these incredibly large and influential companies. Uh, to make that concrete, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google are now all public companies. Combined, they have something close to a trillion dollars in market capitalization. Together, the four of them employ fewer than 150,000 people, and that's less than the number of new entrants into the American workforce every month. And it's roughly half the number of people that work for General Electric. Ironically, one of the few bright spots is a modest rise in U.S. manufacturing, an early casualty of automation that is making a comeback because of it. Annual investment by U.S. manufacturers in new technology has increased almost 30 percent since the recession ended, and research institutions and robotics companies funded by venture capital are constantly searching for innovations like the Roomba vacuum cleaner. 
That strategy has already had some success at Adept Technology, the largest manufacturer of industrial robots in the country with a wide and varied product line. John Dolcinus is the CEO. So this is our flagship product. This is uh, our Cobra robot. This is the class of robot that was used to automate uh, Philips electric shavers. The robots at the Dutch company's factory in the Netherlands proved to be so efficient and economical that Philips decided to move its main shaver assembly line out of China and back to Holland. I think that those workers in China, in India, are more in the bullseye Absolutely. of this automation tidal wave that we're talking about than the American workers. But even if offshore manufacturing returns to the U.S., most of the jobs will go to robots. When I see what computers and robots can do right now, I project that forward for two, three more generations. I think we're going to find ourselves in a world where the work, as we currently think about it, is largely done by machines. And what are the people going to do? That's the $64,000 question. Science fiction is actually my best guide because I think we are, in that time frame, going to be in a very weird, very different place. All right, so that was a little montage of a few different clips, just of not even all, but some aspects of this fourth industrial revolution. So I thought we'd uh, pause there and um, just get some reactions to what we've seen. Yeah, um, well, Eli, Eli and I live in Huntsville, and Huntsville is a big NASA town. You know, it's it's all high tech, just about. You know, you got robotics everywhere. Just about two miles from me where I'm living, huge Google plant going in. Uh, we have, uh, the last I heard was there, there's so much business coming in here that they recruited that they need to get 25,000 more workers, but they're all pretty much high tech, high end jobs. You know, they're not, they're not the guy who would, you know, would, would work on assembly and, and then you have I think I live 14 miles from the Tennessee border. And, you know, every day you see Tennessee cars coming into Huntsville. You know, there's really no jobs over in Tennessee in these areas, but they're, you know, they're coming in here. And my, you know, what I'm seeing and what I guess I'm afraid of is that someday we may have a war on robotics, you know, I mean, it's inevitable if it keeps taking people's jobs. You know, it's the old capitalist system. You know, you just keep, you know, draining people of everything that you can, but you don't train enough people to, to do these jobs. You know, and it's literally wiping out, just like it did, you know, wiped out the farmers and the coal miners and, you know, Everybody else, it's it's continuing to just to wipe people out for the you know for the uh, for the the one percent you might say, and that's basically I think is what made the one percent. So uh, it's my opinion that uh, they're not doing enough, and I I can say that government uh, is not doing enough to train people to do these types types of skills, you know, that, to do these types of things, and the ones that do have some of the skills are the ones that's getting the, you know, the, the, the good jobs and the, you know, the cream of the crop, or they're importing people from other countries, I know, you know, and to take over these jobs when they're not training people, you know, it's like if they're not sending, and then they're sending our jobs to some other country. So I think, I don't know, I think nothing short of a revolution <laughs> is going to change things. But that's an amazing, just an amazing uh, uh, piece of film there. And boy, that's something we could certainly use. I think we need to get more knowledgeable about this stuff, you know. But anyway, that's just my thinking on it. Um, Absolutely. I'll, I'll get you the clip. There's a little more to it. I just didn't think we had time, but I'll, I'll make sure you yeah. get the clip. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask if in that 60 Minutes clip, uh, if at the end, do they mention the idea of uh, universal basic income at all as a solution, you know, rather than um, training people to do these jobs that the machines are going to do uh, or to repair the machines or whatever, maybe the solution from the government or is, 
a UBI, something like that. Yeah, and I, I think it's a really, I, I think it's very important to watch and it's very, uh, a very interesting debate right now um, because there's a lot of people in Silicon Valley that see these trends, right? I mean, they're doing it, it's right in front of their faces and they're not dumb, right? They know that if they automate workers out, then who's gonna buy the stuff that they make with these robots, right? Um, and so there's a lot of interest in UBI in, in Silicon Valley. I think Andrew Yang's you know, pri Democratic presidential primary campaign, and now he's running for, uh, for mayor of New York City with this um, you know, UBI, a universal basic income platform. But you know, one of the things that is uh, you know, scary is you, and there's actually a, an interview of him talking with one of these more right-wing uh, podcasters at one point where Yang just comes out and says like, yeah, the point is, is that, um, you know, people will opt in to a universal basic income program because, you know, everyone wants cash, right? You just, it's just cash. And so people will opt into that, but the price of it will be to destroy entitlements, right? The, 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 the price of it, like literally explicitly in Andrew Yang and many of the other plans uh, is, well, if you accept UBI, it means you give up your right to, um, you know, all and any other entitlement that you might be uh, eligible for, whether it's food stamps or, um, you know, any other kind of benefit would get replaced with UBI. Um, so, you know, we would trade entitlements that, you know, previous generations fought for, um, for a, a cash UBI that then could be lowered at any time, right? Um, we still don't actually have power in that situation, uh, right? They, it could be, you know, modified or changed at any time. On the other hand, like, you know, where is the demand going to come from um, is an enormous question. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the things they've tried to do is, um, you know, just extend people credit, right? That um, one of the way they try to cover this difference between this incredible productivity and these flatter falling wages is just to extend more credit and get people into more debt, such that you know the current figures are that um, U.S. household debt in the first quarter of this year reached 14.6 trillion dollars. Uh, it's never been higher. We have an, a you know this enormous, enormous, enormous amounts of debt is is one solution, right? The extension of mortgage. Uh, mortgages to more and more people, credit cards to more and more people, you know, auto notes to more and more people. But of course, this is only a very short-term solution. And we know what happened, you know, in, in 2007 when people couldn't pay these mortgages and we had this massive real estate crash. But moreover, this fact that we're, you know, just carrying around almost $15 trillion in household debt that acts like a kind of a wet blanket on top of the whole economy, right? When they try to do things that are supposed to stimulate the economy, like these various stimulus checks, I mean, I don't know about you all, but every dollar that we got in our stimulus checks just went to, to chase Manhattan Bank for our credit card bills. Like literally, we didn't buy a single new thing. It didn't stimulate any new, you know, demand for any kind of goods and services. It just went to, you know, bank, Wall Street bank executives like fourth or fifth yacht, right? That, that we have uh, in, in part their attempt to solve this problem of how do you complete this circle? We're automating workers out of production, but we need consumers to, to buy the, the things that this high-tech production can produce, one way to try to deal with it is to extend credit, but we know that blows up in their faces. But I mean, I think the real truth of it is that they don't know what to do. Uh, I think that they are even, you know, the 1%, the owning class doesn't have a solution for this. Um, there's some other clip, I'll share another uh, link to this clip by this guy, Ray Diallo. He's the founder of one of the oldest and largest hedge funds in the world. And he has the exact same position as these, as these two MIT uh, professors. He's saying, you know, figuring out what to do with all the human labor replaced uh, by high technology is the fundamental question of our time. 
Um, and he's someone with a lot more information than us, right? He's sitting uh, at kind of one of the closest things to a kind of command and control center of global capitalism as, as there is. And he's saying, you know, they don't have a solution. Uh, and so this is, I, I, and I think Hai is right. I mean, this is an objectively revolutionary moment uh, where, you know, I, I think it's comparable to, to like the agricultural revolution, like 12,000 years ago, where we went from, you know, hunter-gatherer societies to agricultural societies, this fourth industrial revolution is incredibly profound in terms of, you know, what does it mean for labor, for wages, for jobs, um, and that there's not, um, there's really not solutions on offer right now. Well, maybe we got one thing going for ourselves as the Republican Party's destroying itself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's hope, let's hope they do. Right. Let's hope they do. Believe me, there's something worse coming behind them. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and the problem is that I see is that who's paying attention? You know, right. there doesn't seem to be enough people paying attention to anything. I mean, you know, uh, you know, Eli knows what it's like here and you folks know in your communities that, you know, how can these people not actually see what's going on? Right. You know, why don't they see what's going on or they just don't want to? Uh, I just heard a joke the other day about there were these two fishes and I was sitting, you know, in the water talking and, and this big fish came by and said, oh, it's a nice water day. And the one looked at the other and says, what's water? You know? I mean, they didn't even know what they were that's swimming right. in. Yes. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty weird. I mean, not weird, but it's always been that way. And unless we get out and educate people like we're doing now, enough people doing it. Of course, there's no Vietnam War or anything that we latched on to the last time in a lot of third, third world country stuff. But this was going to be a lot worse. It's going to be a lot worse. Looking back, I think we were at a revolutionary moment in 1972, 1973. Mm -hmm. And what we didn't realize at the time was that the ruling class won the revolution and they did it in such a subtle way that we never even knew it happened. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and I think, you know, Colleen's, you know, I keep talking about Colleen's dissertation. I think it's one of the best I've ever read. But, you know, she talks about how, you know, how do you identify the poor, you know, but okay. also we talk about um, why are they poor, you know, right. and people don't realize they're poor. So they get brainwashed into this whole thing of believing because they're, they're in debt or that they have this, this high tech stuff in front of them like we do now that they're not poor because they got the same thing as the guy who's down the street that's got the Cadillac or we used to say or the Lexus or whatever. So it's it's hard to convince people that, you know, you're poor, you need to do something about it when people don't realize or refuse to admit that they're poor, you know, but if they could just see what these robotics are doing, yeah, artificial intelligence, you know, what's going on in this world and what's going to happen in the next next 10 years is going to be tragic yeah and maybe then you now we tried to organize a a union here and uh mm -hmm. you know um amazon and failed you know people just they don't they won't vote for a union they can help them out so you know what are you going to do but anyway i'm gonna have my soapbox now well <laughs> i uh, i noticed when you were introducing chris that he had studied with David Harvey and um, I had the pleasure of participating in a, a Marx study group that started at the back last March when everything fell apart uh, and we uh, started off by watching David Harvey's 12 lecture series on Marx Capital One. Marx figured this out even practically before capitalism was even a thing, relative surplus value. The, the way that we keep getting screwed is that productivity increases and the capitalists say, oh, okay, great, we'll raise wages now. But the way the 
<laughs> the amount that wages go up is on a only a small fraction of the amount of value that has been produced. And so we get what we got now, 95% of the increase of value goes to the top 1%. But, the, but still, that few percent of money that went to the bottom improves people's lifestyles. Now they have cell phones and flat screen televisions and electric cars and stuff that, you know, my parents couldn't even imagine and would, would consider fabulous wealth. So right. how, how long is that going to go on? I mean, are they going to invent a machine that eats hamburgers now as opposed to to a machine that can order them and make them. I mean, what what's going to happen? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. These 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 are the questions of our times. And yeah, I I made those those videos uh, of of David Harvey. And John was the uh, intrepid uh, cinematographer for the volume two videos, which were shot at uh, at Union. Oh uh, wow! Thank you. That that is an amazing piece of work. Thank you. They've, um, They've have they've reached an incredible global audience of millions, and the the volume one lectures have been trans are in the process of being translated into forty five different languages. Um, it's been incredible the the pickup of that. But I if I can, I just want to share a couple more slides and uh, and bring this to a, a conclusion here, if that's all right. Um, I just. All right. Um, people could see this slide of two uh, logos. Yeah. All right. Do you know what these two corporate logos are? Kodak and Instagram. Kodak and Instagram, exactly. And I think that comparing Kodak and Instagram is just a really interesting way of uh, understanding, you know, kind of the uh, the difference between kind of second industrial revolution uh, work and business and technology and labor and fourth industrial revolution, right? So Kodak on the left was founded in 1880. It took until 1980 to reach a valuation of $1 billion. So that's a hundred years. And uh, at their peak, they had 130,000 employees. Um, working to produce that that value, right? Um, so that's Kodak. We all know, uh, or at least if you're old enough, you know what Kodak is, right? Um, they actually invented the digital camera, but um, didn't really pursue it because they didn't want to cannibalize their film developing business and uh, turned out to be a bad move. But contrast Kodak to, um, to Instagram, uh, which was founded in 2010, it was valued at a billion dollars two years later in 2012 when they had a total of 12 employees, right? 12 employees can produce a value of a billion dollars today that in a past period, it took 130,000 employees, 100 years uh, to create a billion dollars worth of value, right? This is, uh, you know, a real difference in kind, right? A striking difference in terms of, you know, the labor that's required to build these, um, you know, a modern, uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution um, business like Instagram, right? And so I just think this is a really um, pithy way to compare these recent changes. And I just wanted to to show two last uh, sections of just, you know, what is the result of this? The result of this is that now three men own the same wealth as the bottom half of the United States, 160 million people, um, just three men, uh, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Warren Buffett, right? Two of the three of them are tech lords and Buffett's a, a Wall Street investor. Um, but this level of inequality has never happened in U.S. history before. It's never happened in world history before. Um, the level of wealth uh, that these men have accumulated, they're now in a battle 
a grotesque battle to see who will be the first trillionaire. Um, that, you know, if you compare the, you know, disparity between uh, the level of inequality today versus, you know, think of anything, right? Think of a slave society, think of an uh, Egyptian pharaoh versus, uh, uh, you know, an ordinary uh, worker in ancient Egypt. There's never been this level of, uh, of inequality as there exists today. And that much of it um, is to do with um, these changes in the way things are produced, right? And that without something, uh, without, without some kind of intervention, we're only going to see this greater and greater uh, concentration uh, of wealth and inequality. But I think, you know, one of the things that um, we really take as a strategic vision is, you know, the way King articulated, Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King articulated his vision for the Four Bills campaign that I know we're all familiar with, but I wanted to play him um, speaking this quote. This was from the Massey Lectures to a Canadian uh, television. The emergency we now face is economic and it is a desperate and worsening situation for the 35 million poor people in America, not even to mention just yet the poor in the other nations, that is a kind of strangulation in the air. In our society, it's murder psychologically to deprive a man of a job or an income. You are in substance saying to that man that he has no right to exist. You are in a real way depriving him of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness, denying in his case the very creed of his society. Now millions of people are being strangled that way. The problem is at least national. In fact, it's international in scope. And it is getting worse as the gap between the poor and the affluent society increases. The dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and Negro, live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize a revolution against that injustice, not against the life of the persons who are their fellow citizens, but against the structures through which the society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. The only real revolutionary, people say, is a man who has nothing to lose. There are millions of poor people in this country who have very little or even nothing to lose. They can be helped to take action together. They will do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. So I just wanted to end with that. Um, I think it's especially striking to hear him uh, in his own words, lay out a strategic vision that was, you know, frankly prophetic. And I think, um, you know, continues to be a kind of a, a guidepost or a kind of a North Star in thinking about um, you know, how we could deal with these, you know, large structural uh, problems uh, in a way that could actually, you know, to have a, to have a, a, a prescription that could meet uh, an accurate diagnosis uh, is, I think, what uh, King's articulation here really offers us. So I wanted to end my presentation there and uh, get some reactions or questions or thoughts. Um, <laughs> I think it's very moving. Um, it just brings back, you know, memories and of what we've been fighting for for years and years and years. You know, and we we've seen this coming. You know, we've seen that we knew that there would, you know, there would be just evil people to take over. Uh, and because that's the way the capitalist system is, is set up, 
it's not set up for anyone that's going to be a fairly decent person. They don't last long. Uh, while we can see what happened to Kennedy's, we can see what happened to, to King, we can see what happened to Malcolm X, we can see what happened to Fred Hampton. You know, we can see what happens to anybody that's trying to change uh, and, and, and improve the lives of people in our society. And I just think that even though, <laughs> I, I mean, even though it's hard, uh, even though there is a lot of work to be done, you know, we, we can't become complacent about this. We have to get out and do whatever we can, just do something, you know? And what I'm seeing is the total, I guess, disjunction or the separation of, of people these days where there's, there's really no leader, you know, uh, other than, you know, the poor people's campaign that's going on now can, can be a very strong leader, um, you know, and, and, and we don't have that now that we used to have. And we don't have it because I don't think there's enough people out there trying to educate people to the fact that we don't have it and we need it, you know. But anyway, uh, I, I think if we don't start paying more attention to what's going on with this artificial intelligence, that they won't need our intelligence anymore. They won't need us anymore. You know, we're going to be irrelevant, and uh, and we're just we're just going to either fade away or or be taken away. And that's the way that I see it. And I think the whole country is going to become extremely fascist uh, if we don't. And I think if people thought Hitler was bad, just wait and see what these people are like. You know, uh, they only live for the dollar. You know, Hitler was insane. You could probably deal with him somewhat. But you can't deal with these people, you know, so we have to organize as much as we can. But I think I want to say, just say thank you for doing this. I think this is very powerful. I'd like to be able to use some of this in other classes or whatever and, you know, and, and keep keep pushing, pushing this forward, you know. It's, uh, yeah. and I think it's really, you know, a do or die situation. I really do. And I don't think people realize it. They can't realize it now during this pandemic. I don't know when they're going to realize it because these people didn't stop. They kept gaining power. Yep. They kept thinking and they get think tanks and they work on this kind of stuff to, to see what they can do to, to keep the power, you know, and they keep us worrying about, Where's that next meal coming from, or how are we going to pay this this other bill? They don't worry about that because we paying them, you know. So I think again, I, I, I have to believe every word that you know Dr. King says, you know. But uh, and he he too is a revolutionary, and I think that we have to somehow go out there and train more train more revolutionaries. You know, but anyway. Yep. Go ahead, Joy. I I missed almost everything, okay? And I apologize, but I just want to say I was listening to the public comments at city council and things are pretty heated over there. So they went on for a while, but there's a, um, a nice sort of, a, her appearance is, middle-class white mom whose son got gunned down by the Huntsville Police Department. And she came tonight and said, you know, said something about how she always looked up to the people on city council. And, you know, to, if, if Tommy Battle waved at her, she thought that, you know, was a good thing and special. But she's come to realize that they're not on our side. They're not on our side. They don't care about us. <laughs> she's starting to have, a, I think, a class identity uh, instead of, um, you know, a white middle class. Supposedly, I don't even know if we have a middle class anymore, honestly. You know, maybe an upper middle class, but 
a real middle class. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So it was just really interesting to hear her go, I've changed my mind about what's going on here. Somebody's waking up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and we should we should be working with her, you know, and other people like that. We really should not let not forget them and and talk to them and work with them because these are the people that's gonna go out and change other people because of their example and what's happened to them. So I'd love to meet this, you know, this woman and talk to her and invite her to come to some of these things. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. She's uh she's yeah. not gonna I don't think she's anywhere close to stopping and yeah. shutting up. Well, that's what we need. An activist. She is an activist yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, and circumstances will do that to you. Unfortunately. Yeah, and I think, uh, and I think we can create other circumstances for people, you know, to to take action. One can hope. Yep. You do. <laughs> you know what you're doing. I know that. Well. I don't know why I just work so hard I'm, and I'm exhausted. I'm in yeah. that boat of, you know, I'm basically a gig worker and I'm finding it really, really hard to have the energy to do my activism lately. Yeah. Yeah. The summer may be a little bit different. I won't be as busy. So you, you might see me out kicking some ass, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I will. <laughs> won't, <laughs> <don't stop. laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> she was... She was in our class, uh, organizing class, and she kicked ass in there too. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, maybe this is a great transition to a plug for next week's class, where we're going to be talking about the poor, organizing the poor, uh, and lessons from history. Uh, our educators are Hi Thurman. Uh, Kristen Colangelo and Willie Baptist. They'll be talking about the, the young patriots. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign, and the National Union of the Homeless. Uh, so we'll be here at the same time. Um, we're all in different time zones, so I'm not going to say what time that is. But Central Time, Central Time, we'll be here at um, 7 o'clock. Uh, and you can find the link on the NASA website. Look for the, the calendar, uh, and you can find the link, the Zoom link. Uh, and looking forward to, to being back with you all. And thank you again to, to Chris, Dr. Chris yeah, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, everybody. Great to meet you. Thanks, folks. everyone. Appreciate y'all. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks everyone.